Yeah, thank you. Um, I hope it will be fun, but this is kind of a new um, presentation setup I'm doing. So everything was basically run into a Jupyter notebook, and so I'm going to present quite some code. I tried to keep it concise. It's okay if you just don't see the whole screen. I also have some bullet points and I will talk you through it. Um, and uh, my hope is to make that available a bit later, also as a blog post with a bit more description that you know, we can come back and follow, follow, follow on it. So um, I'm working for um, Agos, which is a Dutch company operating in the agricultural and financing, financial tech sector where we are developing a supply chain management platform. And without going into too, too, too much details, I will use this experience as a, as a context to run my example for this talk. So the heart of supply chains uh, is the goods and how they are processed by chain participants and how they move from one chain participant to the next. So it stands to reason that a supply chain management platform then um, chucks the goods as they move through the chain, right? And when they are not in movement, the goods are basically uh, stored somewhere, they have a location, and that's the concept I will use to illustrate race conditions here. So how can I represent, um, in a nutshell, a location uh, well, with Python? I will really focus on a few attributes here. I will give it a name. I will give it an owner who is a chain participant, uh, or just a reference to a chain participant here. And also, um, a location can have um, child locations, right? Or seen from the other angle, a location can have a parent. So we can have a hierarchy of locations. Uh, like we have a generic location, let's say like you know a big warehouse space in which then you can have like more um, uh, smaller locations located within. I'm also adding here an identifier field so that we can reference locations between them without having to load everything in memory. So we only work with what we need here. So that's a model for a location, but obviously we want to work with more than just one. So we will need also to store them. Um, and in this case, I'm I just like the Python interface interfaces, and the dictionary is one of my favorites, so I'll just basically use that abstraction to, um, to handle my, my store of locations, right? So, so I can basically just uh, retrieve a location by its identifier, uh, insert or update uh, with the set item of the dictionary interface, and also, you know, remove per identifier. So that's basically, Imagine the, the, the store of locations is just a dictionary of locations to which we, we also add a name index so that we can then look up by name and I will come back to that in a bit. It's, it's just um, to support an invariant with unique names basically. So that's, that's just like a, um, well, an implementation of a repository. We don't really have to look at it. It's basically just using a dictionary to store locations and, um, and piggybacking on that to also have an index on names. That's just what it is. So throughout the demo, I'm going to just use a singleton here, right, to, to, to instantiate and store my locations. And I will actually not use the singleton directly. I will hide that behind a context manager so that we, um, we have a nice abstraction to work with especially if we had enough time to replace the repository with, uh, uh, with a wrapper around the database. I, I had slides of that, but that's just a bit too long. So we still have a nice interface uh, for Context Manager. We basically um, get a, repo, a, repository, a repository instance, and then we work on that as if it was a dictionary of locations, basically. So that's, uh, that's locations and then a bundle of locations, but I don't want to just work with that. That's a bit too much, well, low level, let's say. So what is the API I want to expose here? What is the business function that I want to, um, to use or you know, to expose as a backend API if, if we were doing that here? Um, so briefly, the read-only API would be how to uh, get a location name, how to retrieve a location parent, and that's just exam that just exemplifies the concept of repository I just mentioned. We acquire a repository, and within that context, 
I have. Oh, I have my, yes, good. And within that context, like once we are within the context manager here, then we just access the repository of locations as a plain dictionary. So nothing should be too surprising here. We get a location, then we just return the attribute that matters. So uh, the name for the first function and the parent ID for the second function. Obviously, that's only read-only. That's a bit limited. We still need to add and mutate data in there. So we will also have a creation, oops, yeah, also have a creation, a create location uh, function. Again, uh, you don't need to look at the whole code here. What matters is, uh, so within the context of repository, first we will validate the invariant check. So is my, uh, is the location name I want to use actually unique in the repository? And if not, then I will just raise an exception and fail. And if it is, then it's fine. I'll just move on and actually create a location and store it in the, in the repository. The uh, next mutation is pretty similar. We have first an invariant check, which is, looks a bit just slightly different uh, because we don't have the context of the owner. We have to read it from the store, but otherwise it's the same idea. And then the logic is we update the location and we basically put it back in the repository to, um, to commit the change. So as a quick example, uh, that might be a bit more, uh, a bit easier to grasp. How do we use this API then? Well, we simply create locations, um, and here we, we pass the first location name and then the company owner, also the chain participant. And we can also pass afterwards parents to have a hierarchical, um, hierarchical relationship. So the main warehouse is the parent of a freezer and some of a storage area, and then we also have shelves that are nested under. And yeah, so we can use, we can use our API here. We can just get the parent, which might be uh, non-existent, must be for the root location. And we can also um, nest calls to then just retrieve, for instance, the location name of the grandparent of a location. So that's just what it is here. So it's a bit of a higher level API uh, that allows us to, um, to basically simulate how, well, imagine if we had a web API, that would be the controller part, right? We, we don't deal directly with the entities, we deal with business functions in which we are encoding an, our environments. So here the uniqueness, uniqueness name of um, a location. Yes. Um, Right, so this, is a, this was a quick setup, basically, uh, to, to, to lay, the, lay the, the scene for the further examples, but I need to introduce a few concepts before that. So we will look at concurrency, race condition, and critical section. And first, concurrency is basically uh, the concept of interleaving multiple tasks on one processing unit. So that is, each task get executed for a short period of time before moving on to another task, and our task, uh, and so on until all tasks complete. Uh, so in Python, and while the global interpreter lock is still a thing, basically all the threads executed in one Python process will run concurrently. So it is something that you have um, every time you use threads. The concept is very similar in AsyncIO with coroutines, because it's also, you basically have one event loop in which you give coroutine like a bit of processing time um, after each other. And that's different from parallelism, which would be the execution of programs on different processing units. And then, um, uh, and, and then we actually have real-time concurrent, not concurrent, real-time parallel executions. That's not for this talk. That's a different set of, um, of problems. So quick example of concurrency, uh, if we use threads, so what matters here is that we basically create threads here, um, and what they will run is a counting, uh, counting loop. Yeah, so they sleep a bit to simulate some more, some more work than they're actually doing, and then they just print uh, who they are and in which part of the loop they are. We start both of the threads 
uh, together, so basically they are now running concurrently, and we wait for completion with the join, join method. And what we can see in the log here is, so we have uh, one, one thread here which ends with uh, 84, and its, it's, its output is basically interleaved with the output of the other thread. So we don't see that the first thread run and executed everything, and then the second thread ran. That would not be concurrent, that would be sequential. So this is just how those two threads are uh, taking turn in execution, basically. Next, the race condition, uh, kind of the crux of this talk. So formally, race condition uh, is the non-deterministic behavior which code path uh, was followed, basically, or the outcome, which data made it first, which data made it last, of a given program. Race conditions are caused by the timing or sequence of events, and that means which, which bits of tasks get executed at one time in what order. So I'll also uh, show an example here. Again, we use one common location, two threads. We start them concurrently, and the idea is that both threads will try to rename the location, the same location, with a different value. And the problem here is that we just don't know what the end name of the location is. Because, uh, because that's, that's, the, that's the thing with the race condition. Either one of the two threads can finish first. We don't know which one. We don't have, a, we don't have synchronization here uh, when we rename the location. So, and that's, that's our problem. But a race condition cannot just happen randomly, right? It has to be somewhere, and we call that somewhere a critical section. That's the part of a program when we access a shared resource in a concurrent manner. And if it's only about concurrent reads, then we don't have any problem because you can just always read the value and uh, whether you do that at the same time or you know, within, ten, within 10 seconds of each other, it doesn't matter as long as you don't have writes or um, side effects. When it becomes interesting is when we have at least one mutation that happens concurrently to other calls, because that's where we can have a risk condition. It's not systematic, and that's, that's the whole exercise here, is, uh, is how to trigger a risk condition so that we can then fix them and, well, not have uh, some probable sort of our heads when we are on production. So let's apply those concepts to the API functions I just, I just defined. I'll only focus on one function, but we can use the definitions, obviously, on at least uh, create location as well. So that's, that's, that's the code I uh, showed earlier for renaming location, and I'm just going to look at a few parts. So the, the first is the shared resource here, the, the first mark, which is the repository. So the repository, if you remember, is just a plain dictionary, so there is no synchronization mechanism in place. It's a shared resource, because if we have several threads accessing the repository, then they are, uh, they are, uh, are sharing it without, uh, without saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to use that now, so please let me be, and, uh, and when I'm done, I'll tell you, and then you can go on. So that's something we miss. And that's why we then have a critical section once we are in the scope of the repository. So from mark one to mark three, that's the critical section. So that mean, that's where we might find race conditions. And actually, we have two race conditions here. Um, one is when we first read from the repository to check if we have an existing location with the same name. Um, because again, we don't know who else is accessing the repository and who else is doing something with it. So what we read now at mark two might not be the same value that is actually stored when we are uh, looking at the guard. Because it's possible that we stopped after reading the value, then somebody changed, changed the value in the store, and what we end up with now is just stale value. Um, that's the same, the same approach we have on the third mark, which is basically that if I'm overwriting a location name and somebody else is doing it at the same time, 
I am not aware of it. So whoever does it last basically wins, right? If I wrote it first, then it gets, it gets overwritten, and I'm not aware of it. So that's, we are basically losing data here. So we have, um, we have an example, basically a static example that I showed you in the function, but that's, um, that's not very, well, yeah, that's not really helpful. Let's, let's just try to run the code and see what it, what it looks like in terms of output here. So again, I will just use two threads, one location, and they will call the rename location function at the same time with different values. And the point is then to understand what value we have in the end who wins the race, and basically who wins the renaming. Because if you lose the race, that means that you are the last one to write the value, and so in the end, you got to say what the location name is. So let's see, um, let's see here. I, so I'm basically copying the same code I had earlier to illustrate what a race condition is. So bear with me as I walk you through it. Um, so I'm going to use functions when I have piece of code so that we can basically replay them a bit. And what we do is we define two threads and they both um, apply the same, the same method. So by default, it would be rename location with different values. Thread one was here or thread two was here. So that we can identify when we look at the final value of the location, who was the last one to write. So again, we will start the thread concurrently and then let them run and eventually retrieve the value that was stored in, um, in that was written uh, on the location. So we can just run that on a new location and yes, okay, sure, we get the value of the name of the location, but that's just one run, so we don't see that that can be another value. That's always just one. So we need the concurrent aspect here. We need to have like, um, yeah, we need to have more, basically more runs to see that we have different values. So I'm just introducing um, here a, a, an orchestrator to basically play out the concurrent and renaming of the location 100 times, and then we look at the results out of 100 times um, who basically won and who could write their own name in the location name. And if we then just apply this, then we have 100 times the same thing we've had before. So 100 times out of 100, location to one, and basically let their mark in the location, which is not what I want to see, because here I'm just, um, I, I, I'm just confident that my code doesn't have a race condition. I mean, look, that's only one value, so nothing can go wrong in production. Uh, no, that's actually not true. The problem is it, within our test, we are not exercising the race condition. We are just hoping it will exercise, which is not the right way to test, obviously. So what we want to do for now is force the computer a bit um, to, to help us and trigger a race condition every now and then. And we will just, uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes, well, no. <laughs> in a minute, we will look at a better way to do that and exercise the race condition ourselves. So I'm here defining a, um, a decorator. So I'm just, so basically this is a function that, an, that I apply to a function to replace the behavior. And what, uh, what I will do here is whatever logic of the function I'm decorating was, I will first do some busy work just to keep the processor busy a bit and let the operating system switch between the two threads so that we can have uh, a bit more of um, concurrent, basically concurrent run between the two threads. Otherwise, they just run too fast and we don't see anything, anything happening. So now if I run uh, my, uh, my, my test run again, I can have finally two different values. So that's great. Now I can see that sometimes thread one finished first and sometimes thread two finished first or last with the values here. So that's, that's better. Because here I can see that the race condition is a real thing. And if I call twice the rename location concurrently, I don't know what value I end up with, which is obviously uh, not a good place to be in. So what we want to do is we want to be able to understand uh, when and how many times a thread will basically um, get interrupted so that we can then 
we can then uh, understand who will win eventually the race condition, or rather, how we can get rid of the race condition in the first place. So here, um, it was trial and, uh, trial and error to know how much busy work I need to have so that I can switch between the two threads, and that obviously doesn't scale well. It just worked on my machine. That's, you know, the trademark works on my machine. So the, 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 the problem is that we really need to have uh, a way of triggering the rest condition programmatically every single time. And we will now look at this. Um, and in general, I need some more definitions briefly, and then we can look at the uh, methods that we can have in Python to do that. So the whole, the whole crux, the whole problem here is that we have concurrent access to a shared resource, the very repository. And how can we protect that resource? How can we enforce that only one person can access it or one thread will access or mutate things at a single time? We have two ways of doing it, uh, what I call implicit, implicit concurrency management and explicit concurrency management. And the implicit way is basically when we can delegate to um, uh, a library or to a lower level. So for instance, if you delegate to the database and then the database can then lock the, the whole table for you or just a row that you want to modify. So you don't have to think about the actual locking mechanism, the actual guard against the shared resource. You just work with this frame, within this framework of you know that when you want to mutate this data, it will be protected, it will be serialized, and only one, only one thread will mutate it at, at the same time. So that's the really general purpose. It's a great abstraction because you don't have to worry about it. You just let the system do it for you. Um, and most of the time, it's just the right approach. Just delegate. But sometimes it's, uh, it's, sometimes it's not so nice, especially if you are really looking for, you want to squeeze the performance out of it, right? And then locking the whole resource, for instance, like guarding against two threads accessing the repository at the same time would just be too damaging in terms of performance. In this case, then you will want to, well, take the matter in your, in your own hands and then use some some uh, specific concept to then protect the shared resource against, against multiple access. And here we call this synchronization primitives. Um, and that basically offers you um, a really tailor-made approach that you can, well, obviously, hopefully you can make it more performant than the general approach. But well, it takes a bit of, uh, bit of care and, uh, and craft to do that. And this, uh, this, this these two concurrency managements, um, well, it would be easier to actually show the first one with an actual database implementation of the repository, which is what I mentioned earlier, the SQLite repository. Um, but, uh, well, that's a bit, a bit too much for that one talk. So we'll, we'll first focus and only focus on the explicit management. And I will just uh, briefly note about the implicit concurrency management later. So what kind of tools do we have in the Python standard library to help us with that? We don't need, we don't need actually anything external. We just we can just use everything that is built in here. So the synchronization primitives I mentioned, the, basically the, the tools in the, in the toolbox, well, in Python, they are just Python objects, and most of them can be used as context manager for an easy scoping, um, easy scoping writing. I think I will uh, be a bit quick on those. So those are yeah, staples in computer science, uh, but it's not specific to Python. What is specific to Python here is just the API, but it's um, pretty much standardized over all of them. So first we have the semaphores, which are, the, which are one of the oldest synchronization primitive that basically count how many things there are in a pool in an atomic fashion. So you can try to acquire something from the pool, and if there is nothing left, then you're basically going to block um, unless you have a timeout. And you can then try to release something from an, another thread in the pool to give access to more things in there. So that's the general concept of semaphores. Uh, we also have a related concept, which is a bounded semaphore, and that's more for um, assertion and, uh, let's, uh, let's say, uh, pre-bug uh, pre purposes. It's just saying that you cannot go past a specific number of things in your pool, otherwise you get uh, an error. 
and that's, that's more of a safety check than anything else. The lock, which is a very basic uh, concept, it's, you can get this seen as a binary semaphore, so you just have either zero or one thing that you can get in your pool, and that basically gives you um, a single access to a shared resource. So it can, can also be called mutex from mutual exclusion, but in some of our programming languages, it has a bit more properties that we are not looking at here. So the typical use case would be uh, to basically protect a singleton against, for instance, double creation. So when you initialize your singleton, you uh, want to make sure you do that only once, so you just acquire a lock to guard access to this, and then nobody can do anything with it until you release the lock. A related concept would be the reentrant lock or recursive lock, which just means that whoever owns the lock can then acquire the lock again without blocking and so on and so forth. Of course, the, the principle is that you release the lock as many times as you acquire it, otherwise you will end up with a, a broken lock and you might just hang in your process. The, the idea is that it's useful when you have like recursive function calls in which you need a lock because the first time you act, actually acquire the lock and then the other times you just like um, reacquire it for free, kind of. You go in and so forth in your recursion tree. Um, the event can be seen as a signal that one thread broadcasts to many threads that are looking for it. Um, basically, imagine like a, it's just a flag, flag propagation. Condition is, uh, is a bit linked to lock, event, and predicate. I'm not going to go into too much details now. Um, it's, it's just a thing. It's a nice thing in Python. And uh, barriers, which are not available in SyncIO but in threads, can be seen as a checkpoint where um, you know how many threads you want to reach that barrier, and once everybody is there, then you just let them go. So if we apply those, those, um, those primitives to, to our race condition example here, which is again to change the location name uh, from two, two threads concurrently. Hey, yep, yeah, yeah, just squishing a bit on that. Um, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, so the, what I want to do now is actually trigger the rest condition programmatically. So I don't want to have busy work and hundreds of iterations, I just want to have one iteration in which I, I know which thread will run to the rest condition and then I can basically make sure that both threads are executing through the rest condition and then causing an error and then I can fix that in the system once I have a reproducible test. And here we'll just apply the uniqueness of a location name as our invariant that might be broken due to a rest condition when we rename a location from two different places. Yeah, so the, the example will just be, again, we have, um, we have two locations and we will just try to rename them to the same name concurrently. That's, that's the code here. So the, the way this is going to work is we will first start both tasks, renaming A and then renaming B concurrently. We'll let them execute, but we'll stop them before they actually persist the change to the repository. So that means that they actually pass the invariant check. So both are allowed to write to the repository, but we just stop them before they actually write. And then once we are there, we can uh, decide who we want to let go on and write the repository. And I, I chose the uh, repository update because that's the race condition I'm looking at. The expected outcome with the current code base would just be that we have basically both locations end up being named the same way because we both passed the invariant check and they were both able to rename it which is, of course, not what we want in the end. But that's, that's the test. We want to reproduce the race location, and we want to make sure that we actually have a bug in our system. So the steps I just mentioned, I will briefly uh, apply the, the, the right synchronization primitives to them. And here it's, it's going to be um, first a barrier to basically 
get everyone up to speed, we create the, the two threads, we make sure that they are initialized and they are running, or rather almost running. And once we are there, we can um, Yeah. Then we can then let begin the task, which will be to rename the location. Um, because remember that I want to do this programmatically, so I want to be in charge of when the thread starts, actually. Right? Uh, potentially, I can have more setup in between, in between the two steps here. Uh, once, once they begin, they will carry out the uh, invariant check. They will change the location name in memory, and I don't want them to just persist it yet. I want them to be ready to do that, because I want to, again, um, be able to decide which of the threads will try or will actually write the location to the repository so that I know then what to expect in terms of, in terms of failure. So here, the update to the repository is just a set item, um, a method in the dictionary, so that's where I will basically add another, uh, another primitive, which will be another event per thread. So it will, it will basically look like um, I can then tell either thread one or thread two to then proceed once I set that event, when I set, once I set the flag. And then finally, the last two steps are basically um, letting them proceed with the, with the event I just mentioned above. Let them proceed and write the repository, and then we wait for them by joining the thread, which actually is using a lock also internally. So we have a barrier, um, a few events, and then a lock in, in this example. And those are really, um, I mean, those, are, those can also use other primitives, but then the semantics is a bit different, but it, they work pretty similarly. Some of them are interchangeable here. So if I just apply now uh, those, or translate them to these steps to code, the first task, the first task um, is pretty similar to the second task, and it's basically we are waiting for everybody to be set up. So that's, that's the barrier, right? Ready to work. Then once everybody is set up, we go on to the next block, which will be uh, when, the, when the test runner will tell us, okay, now you can actually start your logic and try the invariant and try to update. And once that is set, once, the, once we get the signal, then we actually you know, call rename A and rename B, which will then rename both locations to the same name. The mutation seem, so the third step, what really matters here is that um, I'm patching the set item of the repository. So that means that I'm really inserting a new block, um, a, new, a new block which is actually uh, uh, an event, a thread, before I allow them to call the real set item on the repository. So the, yeah, the exact, um, the exact logic is here. The intent is clear. And if we wrap all of this together, we end up with this long piece of code. But basically what we have here is we, again, uh, well, we define first the objects that we're going to work with, uh, the synchronization primitives. We initialize both threads with their own uh, logic function that we defined above, and we pass the right right primitives, we start both of them, and then we wait for them to be actually ready to do work. So that's, that's the barrier that all three threads, the runner and the two task threads, are going to wait for. Once we are there, we know that both threads are ready, and we can just signal them to go on and actually try to do the, uh, the invariant check. So after a bit of more um, initialization, that's basically step two. Then we can let them, we let them know that they can actually start. And so now concurrently, both threads are checking the invariant, getting the change ready in memory, and then they are stopping again before they can persist to the repository. Because if we didn't stop them, if we let them go further, then we are actually potentially in the race condition, right? Because then if thread one did write, if it just executed everything before thread two, then thread two will just read 
the value from the Earth, which is already fed once value. And then we are not triggering our risk condition. Uh, so step three is basically to make sure that all threads um, have passed through the invariant check and were able to perform the change in memory. So that's when we call the final two steps, which we first let task one, which is the, well, the first thread one, so renaming A to C to run, and we wait for it to complete by joining the thread, and then we do that also for step uh, second thread, location B. And well, I mean, we can just execute this against the repository here. I'm actually calling it, and I don't see an exception. That's, I guess that's good news. And if I now try to look at the actual values, the actual names that we have written for both location A and location B, I can see that they have the same name for the same owner. So my invariant was broken. And that's exactly what I wanted to see. I could reproduce the race condition programmatically step by step. And now I know that I have a bug and I need to take care of it. Just to make sure that I'm not saying anything stupid. Uh, if I try to use the same name again, then yes, I get an invariant check error. So my invariant check is working. That's not a problem here. All right, um, so basically I will uh, give you a couple of solutions here uh, as to how, I, how we can solve this now that we could reproduce it. And um, it's, yeah, it's just a few lines every time. That's, that's, uh, that's a nice thing. So the first, the first solution, which actually could be seen as the, an implicit concurrency management, would be to lock the whole repository every time we try to access any location in it. So basically, you would say, I have exclusive access to repository now, so I can do whatever I want. Nobody will see what I do until I leave the scope and then some other thread, only one, can uh, take the hand of the repository and go on there. So in this case, um, I can just use, well, if I had a database, I could use an exclusive connection mode, um, or in this case, I just lock my singleton and lock, remember, it's just a binary semaphore, so only one thread can hold the lock at a time. The others will just wait until the, thread, until the lock is free, and then only one will get it. And once I have a lock, I'll just have access to the repository, which means that in my functions, when I am in the scope of the repository context manager, it's now a synchronized access. I am the only one accessing, accessing the repository, which means that all the code that is after that, it's not a critical section anymore. I cannot have a risk condition on locations because nobody else can do anything with locations besides me. So that's one way to solve it. Um, it's like, uh, it's a bit brutal, but well, it works. And unless you are looking for more performance, you know, simple is uh, it's usually better. You can just stick with this. Um, and then, yeah, so um, the prob I, I would have had a problem if I run my test again. Um, I will just leave that as a, in, in there, but basically I, I would need to change how I exercise my rest condition now, because since I have a lock, I cannot have both threads uh, being inside the rename location function at the same time, because only one has access to the lock, so only one can execute the invariant check at one time. So we need to account for that and introduce a few more synchronization primitives, um, which we don't do that here. Or I add a bit of um, a bit of a timeout to to let basically the, the other thread do their work. But obviously, this value here of one second, in when I give some time of to the other thread to to do something, is again the same problem we had before. It's well, it's not scalable, it just runs on my machine. So that's just a quick way to, to make it work uh, with, a, with a global lock. And um, indeed, now if I reset my locations and I try again to access the in-memory, uh, to access yeah, the in-memory locations from two threads, I get an error in one of the threads, which is what I wanted to see. Uh, because now that means that one thread will be aware but it failed to actually carry out the operation. I didn't change anything in my test, I just added the lock. So that's good, I could fix it. 
And if I look at the values of both locations, yep, indeed, uh, only one was changed in this case, location A, because it was, fir it was the first thread that I released from its uh, signal first. Uh, we can have a few more solutions, um, but I will be just briefly mentioning them. So we could also only lock uh, the mutation operations instead of locking the whole repository. So that's, that would be a bit more, a bit more focus. It's basically, uh, remember that the race condition is only a problem if you have at least one mutation, right? If you only have reads with access, you don't have any problem because you don't have any side effects, you don't have any changes. Um, so by only locking the mutation, uh, then we can, we can just uh, scope a bit the scope and hopefully let the overread access be more performant and not blocked when I want to carry one mutation operation. So that's the nice thing. It's only about a subset of calls, uh, hopefully um, not the main calls. And uh, I mean, well, that's just one example way of how I would model that here, I would just you know, add a flag to the repository saying, oh, I'm about to do a mutation in this context, so please uh, get a mutation log for me, and then I would carry the work. Alternatively, we could also um, have some final grain even, and come up with a log per location name, because that's, that's the invariant that we want to check. And we are very much into handcrafting um, tailor-made solutions here because I want this invariant to not fall into a critical section but there is no race condition that can happen there. So I designed the minimal lock to basically free that, uh, that invariant from the, from the critical section. It's a bit more involved because then you have to be really precise on which name you want to do. But the intent is much clearer. It's more explicit. I'm saying I'm about to mutate only this location name. So then, I mean, in the, in the back end, I have to do a bit more work because I have more logs to maintain and, and potentially more, uh, more exceptions to, to handle. But from the use of, of, uh, of the code here, it's much clearer. It's not, it's not left to... Um, to the whims of the database as to in which exclusion, exclusion mode you are, isolation mode you are. So to conclude, um, you don't always have problems. If you don't have concrete mutations, you don't have problems, that's fine. You can have as many threads as you want, as long as you have only read access. And it's not because you identify a race condition, it's not because you see a critical section, but it will happen. And that's the problem here that I wanted to alleviate. It's hard to reproduce, it's hard to test. If you don't even spot it in the first place, you might be well aware, you might be unaware of it uh, from your test suite because unless you have enough data, as I showed you with busy work, or unless you have a more programmatic approach, it will likely not show and you might just end up one day in production uh, realizing that you have a bug, no idea where it comes from, no data to investigate, no forensics, and then that's, that's the best, well, no, that's the worst place to be in. As much as you can, I would advise to delegate to lower levels, so let the database handle uh, logs at row levels or at table levels. If, you, if that's not enough or if you want more performance, double check your architecture. So the example here was obviously a bit contrived um, and we could have come up with an alternative way of modeling things to not have uh, such a high dependency on the, uh, on the repository uh, being in a, in a singular access. And when all of this is not enough, just, just exercise the risk conditions yourself. Just make sure that you can reproduce them if you see them, and then that you have a failing test, and then you can fix it and keep that in your test suite. Don't let that be a happenstance or don't let chance come into play. And that's basically, that's basically it for, for my talk. Thank you.